Good evening, and thank you for joining us at Newground's annual Spotlight Storytelling event, Breaking Bias. This year, again, we come to you virtually, and while we dearly miss seeing you in person, we celebrate the fact that people from all over the world and storytellers from coast to coast are able to come together this evening. This year in our programming, we've shared frank discussions of racism, bigotry, and ignorance within our Muslim and Jewish communities. We've talked about what is, and we've started to lean into what it means to heal. Tonight, we'll hear from six storytellers, and after that, we'll invite you into breakout rooms where you can share stories of your own. This project was made possible with the support from California Humanities, a nonprofit partner for the National Endowment of the Humanities. Visit www.calhum.org to learn more. We're also grateful to many of you who made donations towards this evening. Thank you. And now I want to introduce the co-directors of this evening's program. Newground Storytelling Consultant, Stacy Chaikin, and Advisory Council Member, Amir Abdullah. Thank you, Aziza. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So glad you're here to join us. We wanted to say a word about how this evening came to be. Since 2007, Newground has hosted an interfaith iftar during the holy month of Ramadan, where Muslims forego the comforts of food, drink, and more for the sake of spiritual growth. This year, for the first time, we present our spotlight storytelling event during the festival of Sukkot, when just a week after Yom Kippur, for seven or eight days, observant Jews forego the safety of solid shelter. We build rickety three-walled huts wide open to the elements. As the winds howl and rains pelt through the woven branches that make up the roof, we're asked to contemplate the existential fragility of our lives. As we make ourselves and our bodies vulnerable, we're asked to wonder where safety and power and strength might lie. We are honored to invite these brave storytellers to share their stories of vulnerability and strength as they explore the possibilities of breaking bias in our often fractured world. I grew up in Brooklyn. When I was in fifth grade, I was spinning my friends on the merry-go-round when Melanie Weiner skulked up to me. Can I ask you a question, she said? Yeah, what? Why would your mom marry a black man? What are you? My mom was a white Ashkenazic Jew. My dad, half black, half Chinese from the Caribbean. What are you? Was a constant question in my life. It still is. My parents met in the most conventional of ways in college. It was rather ordinary for the time and place. It was 1960s at NYU, who wasn't in an interracial relationship. But marriage was a whole different story. My mom had dated black men before, so bringing home my father was no big deal. My grandparents thought it was a phase, and eventually she would settle down with a nice Jewish boy. Instead, they eloped at City Hall. My dad did not even tell his own parents. My mom's younger sister was their witness and their only wedding guest. My mom was fierce. When my parents were ready to buy a house, only Mo went to the open houses. The seller in our own all white neighborhood had no idea she had black husband and black children. After we moved in, we got bomb threats. Bring it on, she said. Mom was fearless. In the midst of all this, we were members of a synagogue and attended Jewish day school. People were surprised, as if by marrying my dad, who was not Jewish, it made my mom less Jewish. It was the opposite. She actually grew up rather secular. She became more observant after getting married, and she was determined to raise Jewish children. In our house, we talked about Judaism a lot, but when it came to race, crickets. 
parents never talked about race. The truth is our family was segregated. We celebrated Thanksgiving and Christmas with the black relatives, Rosh Hashanah and Passover with the Jewish ones, and there the two shall meet. Only the Jewish relatives were invited to our bat mitzvahs, supposedly to save money. And my parents thought that if they ignored the reality of racism, we wouldn't experience it. It was a wonderful utopian ideal. It meant that I didn't know how to discuss issues of race. I honestly didn't know what was in my head and what was real. For some reason, I thought the word church and the word Jesus were cuss words. God forbid I tell my Jewish friends that I celebrated Christmas with my grandparents. I had my first boyfriend. My cousin asked, is he black or white? I don't know, I said. And I didn't. He was Indian. I really didn't know. I was friendly and extroverted on the outside. Inside, I was a mess. And we just didn't talk about any of it. Back in fifth grade, the same year Melanie Weiner asked me that loaded question. My mom died of an aneurysm. She was 40 years old. I was 10. And Tani was 13. My dad kept our Jewish home going, but still ignored topics related to the, the color of our skin. I've since slowly opened up to him. We're still processing. To this day, as a 46-year-old mother, board member of my synagogue, and proud activist, the hairs on the back of my neck still tingle when I'm asked again and again, what are you? I wonder what my mom would say. Melanie Weiner friended me on Facebook a few years ago. I hadn't seen her since elementary school. Kind of Facebook stalked her to figure her out from a distance. She seemed okay. I liked her. But asked if she remembered that moment on the playground, the one that was so deeply etched in my memory. She did not. She said she was horrified and embarrassed, but not surprised. We said things like that in our home all the time. That's how I grew up, she said. She said she's not raising her own daughters that way. She wanted me to know that she had broken that cycle. And I have too. My husband and I talk about race all the time with our girls. My six-year-old is acutely aware that she looks different than her your school classmate hard to hear her wish for long hair that sways and peachy skin. It's hard and we talk about it. I think I know what my mom would say. I believe there are two different types of people in this world, with two different types of voices, two different types of smiles. One of which teeth are made of stolen diamonds, diamonds which kings sit upon, inheriting power stronger than God's words against sinners. Surrounded by soft lips the color of snow that have kissed so little but are more privileged than some could ever come to know. Tongues which have tasted gold itself today and centuries long ago. Yet their teeth are rotting, rotting from the poisonous lies spit like venom. Rattle loud enough to push us over a wall that was never built. Then there are smiles made of teeth so strong they could bite through walls of stone. Stone which had been placed there from ancestors now who sit higher than the throne. For their mouths have tasted soil, soil that holds together our earth, shaped in the hands of genuine royalty. Vibrant flowers which have been planted amongst the ground, risen and birds from drinking sweat and blood, feasting on violence only to grow taller. Lips which have sipped life from the rivers, for their bodies have bathed in God's true silver. For they have kissed angels, angels which could only bless them with hope and each other. 
where it's formed and birthed from the tongue, vigorous enough to heal bite marks and fight the venom that runs through our blood, making it a part of us. For truth is like an antidote, an antidote for blindness, fixing one's vision, focused and clear, allowing you to see how people truly appear. If you were to look into the blue eyes of a man, a man so cruel, even barbaric, would you look through his God-given gift of whiteness and see his true colors far beneath? Or would your own eyes be blinded by the blueness in his? Thomas Jefferson once said, all men are created equal. For the thought of that was so important, they tethered it into a paper of agreement which bonds our country together as one. For it was carved in walls, carved in our heads as children. Yet the mouths I hear and the eyes I see stay different. For all I feel is hatred. Hatred directed upon what makes us different. So different we stand out from God himself. The patterns of our hair tell our spiraling story. The white shadows in our corners watching, judging, telling us to quit because of something that doesn't define us. Growing up, we are told to love ourselves and the skin given to us as a gift. Yet how is it we feel captive to it? For we want to scream and cry, drown in our own tears of frustration. But more than wanting to burn down cities which hold adversaries, we want to fight. For it should not be a privilege or a right to be the color of stone cold milk. But we don't. We say nothing for the fear of facing what our ancestors fought so hard for our generation to avoid. So we commit the worst crime of all. We stay silent. Staying silent is like a hurricane compared to being quiet. Not only do your words and your rights break, but underneath it all your soul, who's tortured every day, breaks. Our silence is what's making every one of us fall into our graves that never belong to us. We allow ourselves to go six feet under, yet we stay silent and we watch. We allow our right to see another free day be taken from us. This cannot be another meaningless headline. For their skin is so delicate and so fine, for our skin is tough. As many times as their skin was bathed in sapphires, our skin was broken only to reveal our scars of history. Our ancestors allowed us our rights to dress like those who feast on gems. Now we must fight for new generations. We must allow ourselves to see more than just black and white. We must introduce our world to true equality, the ability to look into the brown eyes of a man without looking away. For our children's future, our future is like clay. We play God as we shape the sun in the way of each day. We must teach the world of love, love stronger than the stone we were forced to bite through, stronger than the screws and nails holding our bones together. So speak, speak for those who've been silenced. Speak for the brown girl who has spoken for you. I'm in a hotel lobby smack dab in the middle of Istanbul, pacing between frayed Turkish rugs. It was 2008. I was there with an American delegation of eight Caucasian college students and seven brown faces nervously and excitedly approached us. We shook hands first with the same gendered individuals and then someone commented that for equality's sake, the men should also shake the women's hands And so we did awkwardly and it was fine. And then Munther walked in late. He's always late. And he rolled his eyes as we reintroduced ourselves. Munther was the last of the Palestinian college students who was there for the exact same reason as me, a cross-cultural exchange focused on political philosophy. Munther and I were undoubtedly and instantaneously co-conspirators. We were definitely the funniest people in the room and we were the troublemakers. I was relieved I wasn't alone. And he was also a comedian. He was also a critical thinker, someone who wouldn't take this whole interfaith thing too seriously. 
So while the other participants drank or slept or called their loved ones back home, Munther and I walked every night, sometimes in silence, but mostly chatting about his love life or my work life. We grew fond of one another. A night before the program ended, I asked him what more he wondered about me. I'd rather not know you, he replied. What? I'd rather not know you, he repeated. Oh, okay, well, that's rude, Mantra. I mean, if you knew me, you wouldn't be able to distance yourself. And that's the whole point of this cross-cultural exchange. Nah, he laughed. I'm just here for the free trip. I laughed too, but I understood that below his deflected joke was a courageous gentleman naming the elephant in the room. If we don't know each other, we can cling on to our biases and we will return home unmoved. I took a breath and I continued walking and Munther realized my hesitation and he took a breath too. We had been walking one in front of the other before but Munther invited me to be side by side now and our shoulders banged as we navigated the narrow paths. We walked in silence to the Blue Mosque, a majestic, religious and historical space where neither of us had ever been before. Rows of tourists and natives alike lined the building inside and out. Do you wanna go in? He asked. I wondered if I could enter with him or if we had to enter alone, apart as men and women sometimes do in mosques and synagogues around the world. I wonder if Munther would ever be able to enter my world. And I wonder if I would ever be able to enter his. Now, 13 years later, we stay in touch through Facebook Messenger. He is married with kids and a wife and more kids on the way. Munther works at a grocery store in East Jerusalem in a neighborhood that's kind, consistent, and friendly, planted halfway between cruel and crueler. We always make empty promises to visit one another and introduce our family of families, but they are empty because while well-meaning and well-intended, there's no chance that I will ever make it through Israel to his Palestinian homeland, even with an American passport and with white privilege nor will Munther ever make it through our customs here after a non-direct flight to New York City or perhaps Toronto, and then drive across the border to my family's home in Buffalo. It's a geographical and political impossibility, but now there is a strong longing to know one another and to share stories. So we share stories in any way we can, but without the nightly walks. It was about 2002. I was 22. I was living on the west side near Santanella with my best friend, Eddie. I was, as I usually am, keenly aware that I was the only person of color living in my neighborhood up until Liam moved in next door. Liam was black, roughly my age, soft-spoken with an easy, sunny smile. A martial artist and an actor, didn't smoke, didn't drink, Liam came from the East Coast with Hollywood in mind. He came keeping it simple, a few things in a meticulously cared for white Cadillac, red velvet interior. We got along well and hung out from time to time. One summer night, we were driving back from a spoken word event at Espresso Mi Cultura, where we saw one of my friends perform. With soul and hip hop softly audible in the background, we chatted as we drove through the streets nearing our apartment complex. Our easy chatter came to an abrupt halt at the sound of sirens and flashing lights. Liam readied his license and registration, lowered his window, planted his hands on the driving wheel and waited for the officer to approach. A second officer stood behind the car. The ease in him was gone, replaced with calm, somber and alert. My heart raced as it does around law enforcement. At the wheel, Liam was steady. This was almost 20 years ago. And in my memory, the conversation went something like this. How can I help you, sir? Your music was too loud. License and registration. 
A chill ran through my body. My heart pounded in my ears. Liam handed him his license and registration, repositioned his hands back on the wheel, and slowly turned his head towards me, and only that. We locked eyes. In a gentle and low voice, he said, I got this. Don't say anything. I wanted to mouth off, but this was my first rodeo, not his. The history was woven into every deliberate positioning and every slow calculated repositioning of his body, every deliberate syllable of his every deliberate word. Sorry, officer, the music was pretty low. Are you aware that your backlight is out? No, sir, I was not. I changed my lights last week. Please step outside the vehicle. Liam exited and walked with the officer to the back of the car. Five, 10 minutes could have passed, I don't know, before Liam was escorted back to his door. No lights were out and we were free to go. I can't do this <laughs> and I don't want to. But up until a few days ago, that was my story a story of a black male living in a white neighborhood on the west side of LA, pulled over only to be intimidated by two white cops who wanted it to be understood that he did not belong there, that he was under their careful, watchful surveillance, a clear story of bias. But tonight is about breaking bias, and the story I was planning to tell was not the full truth, and I knew it, and my body would not let me leave it. I couldn't sleep, I had panic attacks, migraines, and heartburn like I haven't had since I was pregnant with Aya. So, first for some context. One, this was a decade after Rodney King, a few years after the Rampart scandal, landmark events that hardly made a dent in police reform. Two, I was born and raised in Grapes of Wrath country, a Central Valley town with plenty of nice folks, and deep roots to the, to the Ku Klux Klan. I was recently graduated from UCLA. I was a hijabi back then, wearing a scarf to cover my hair. It was just post 9-11. Widespread community surveillance, secret evidence, FBI at the doorstep, interrogations, the threat of being rounded up in camps, dark humor to cope, hate crimes, swastikas, assaults, murder, all news commonly heard in our networks, but rarely covered in the media. Decades of racism against our community, the deep, dark, unresolved history of racism in this nation, and my own history of childhood sexual assault. Not long before that night with Liam, I was chased on the 405 North by two white boys in a white pickup yelling slurs, threatening to ram me. My local PD refused to file a report. So, there I was, an Arab American Muslim hijabi living in a freshly minted post 9-11 world, driving with a law-abiding black male in a not so post Jim Crow world. And I was smoking a joint. Well, what had happened was I had been smoking a joint earlier in the car on our way home. It was still in my hand when they pulled us over. I prayed the cops couldn't smell it. I discreetly tried to drop it outside the window but maybe it fell in the car. And that's the part I wanted to leave out because telling the truth, the whole truth, opens you up to forms of attack that are real. In addition to contending with American racism and Islamophobia, I knew I would have to contend with being judged, dismissed, and being delegitimized for smoking pot in a car with a guy. And this could harm the people and issues I care about and work so hard to advance. So that's why I kept it to myself and a few close friends until now. But this is a story for another time because this, is, because this story is not about a joint. It's about the weight of a joint. It's about the weight of a joint in Liam's life, how it could have too easily tipped the scales in that moment. A life that exemplifies too many others. The enormity of this burden, the mental, emotional, economic, spiritual, physical strain the mounting traumas carried across life, across generations of being preyed upon. And it's about a young woman dealing with the weight of her own world, 
memories of child childhood trauma, questioning the worth of her own life, and how, in striving to cope, she could have gravely endangered her friend. I don't know if Liam saw it that way, but a chill settled into the quiet of the remainder of our drive, only blocks away from home. My friend David and I entered the Pico Union project on a Friday night, the sun going down. We were there for an interfaith Shabbat Iftar with JQ International and Muslims for Progressive Values. David's friend Jim invited him, so he asked me to come along. Under warm wooden beams and stained glass, Jim introduced me to a big bald Bangladeshi man with a shaved head, goatee, and wide brown eyes. His name was Yazin. We chatted about Jewish customs. I told him, I don't know much about traditional Eastern European or Ashkenazi customs as I'm a Sephardic Jew. He said, oh, my heart dropped. I knew what was coming next. It's the same every time I tell people I'm Sephardic. They pause, look me up and down, and then they say, but you're so pale. Just a few minutes away from where we were standing at Pico Union on what is now Martin Luther King Boulevard, there is a church. Until the 1970s, it was the Sephardic Brotherhood. Stories of that place run through my blood. My grandfather, Pop, was the temple president multiple times. My grandmother, Nani, was on the board of the sisterhood. My mother, Jackie, taught Hebrew school. And every Sunday, waiting for her at the exit, was my besotted Ashkenazi father, Bob, who had fallen in love with her and her culture. The word Sephardic translates as descendants of Sephardad or Spain. Before the 1400s, Jews thrived under the protection of the Muslim Moors. They were allowed to practice their faith while being a part of society until in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and King Ferdinand kicked out every Jew. At least that's how I learned it. After my family left Spain, they lived in Turkey for over 400 years before my noni's family, the Abravayas, came to New York and then followed their children to Los Angeles in 1945. It's a long story how we got here. Let's just say my great-grandfather Solomon might have tried to kill a sultan. We're feisty like that. When my father started dating my mother, it was a culture shock. The food! Mediterranean flavor, sharp cheeses, fish, vegetables, bright tomato and lemon. In lieu of the minor Ashkenazi keys, our cantor sang with Arabic style inflections. The harsh cadences of Yiddish were replaced by romantic Ladino, a combination of medieval Spanish, Portuguese and Hebrew. And unlike American nuclear families, there was a galaxy of cousins and close friends constantly together eating, singing, playing games, visiting each other's houses, warily watching my father when he came to pick up my mother for dates. He wanted desperately to be a part of that. When my sister and I were born, we were the golden children. We were blessed in the temple, which had now merged with other Sephardic temples into a beautiful congregation in Westwood. Whenever my noni saw us, she'd exclaim, mashallah, or praise God from the Arabic. When I was born, I was given her name, the family name, as every other generation of women is named Reina or some variation of it. It's Sephardic custom to name after the living. Although I'm not sure if it was Sephardic custom for her to keep bringing it up to pressure me to get married and have lots of babies. I never knew we were different from other Jews until I was around 11 years old. We lived in Thousand Oaks. Going to the Sephardic temple in Westwood was a long commute. So we were sent to Hebrew school at the local temple. On Passover, they gave us mini Seder plates with two mashed up fish balls. What's that? It's gefilte fish. I'm not touching that. I took Yiddish, which was my mother's equivalent of getting a tattoo. I said good Shabbos. She screamed at me until I said Shabbat Shalom. I devoured books on the Holocaust. My mother worked for the Shoah Foundation. She translated Holocaust testimonies in Ladino. I wanted to fit in, 
but I knew I never would. In college, it got worse. I went to Shabbat dinners at Hillel with weird dishes like cholent, kugel, zimis, whatever that is. I'd say I'm Sephardic and first the, oh, then the pause, and then the look over. And finally, but you're so pale. I found comfort in my family's traditions, learning how to make Sephardic foods, singing Ladino cantares, going to the Sephardic temple with my But the family was shrinking. My grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, my mother. She was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer in 2014 and died two years later. As her body was giving up, her mouth filled with important things she wanted me to know. She made a confession. She hated my past affiliations with Orthodox Jewish people. Why? That's when she told me about my great-grandfather Solomon. He was clean shaven and dark from the sun, dating back to his days working in the port of Istanbul. Great-grandmother died. He lived in Hancock Park, one of the most Orthodox Jewish neighborhoods of Los Angeles. On Shabbat, Solomon wore suits and walked to synagogue like any other religious Jew in the neighborhood. But he wasn't like them. And his neighbors let him know that. They spat on him and told him he wasn't really Jewish. He wasn't Jewish because he was too dark. And over and over again, like the chorus of a song, I am told I am not Sephardic because I am pale. So here I am standing in the Pico Union project under wooden beams and stained glass with this burly Bangladeshi man. And I tell him I'm Sephardic. And he says, oh, he asks, do you speak Ladino? There were a million things he could have said. And instead he asks about Ladino, a language that is practically part of my DNA. The language my grandparents and mother would speak at their table so we couldn't understand them. The language of the cantares that Solomon sang on recordings for UCLA. My nunny wept as she heard her father's voice for the first time in 50 years. At the iftar, Yazin gave a speech about being a gay Muslim man, about how he always felt he didn't belong, how happy he was to find Muslims for progressive values, where he could learn to be Bangladeshi, Muslim, and gay at the same time, and how he loved studying Spain from the time of the Moors, where Jews and Muslims lived together, how it sparked the golden age of Spain and brought forth intellectuals like Maimonides, born in the town of Cordoba, the town my family came from. Yazin's reverence for my ancestral home, my ancestral language allowed me to feel seen no matter the color of my skin. Yazin is still my friend. When I think of him, I think of that Ladino song about brothers and sisters united under one sky. Qual son los, qual son los dos, dos Moshe y Aaron. Uno es el criador, uno es el criador, uno es el criador, Baruch Hu, Baruch Shemo. To the white boy who pulled off my hijab in seventh grade gym. Every morning, you sat on those bleachers. Dirty brown hair, green day t-shirt, ripped jeans. So desperate to screw your parents' money. Poor thing. You couldn't accept Coach Bell yelling at you. Change into gym shorts, bare your pretty pale legs, get in line, run faster, shoot straighter, stop being a wimp. While well, I got to run in long sleeves, jump hurdles in sweatpants, and sit out of flag football the whole month of Ramadan. I got to pray in the principal's office and read my Quran during study hall. I defied rules in plain sight. 
In Latin class, I emerged as Artemis, virgin goddess of the hunt, sacred guard of chastity, bow and arrow in hand. I couldn't be grasped. Sometimes I'd catch you leaning on the goalpost, arms folded, staring green-eyed right at me. That Thursday, you decided to figure me out, strolled past me and my girlfriends on the mats and smiled. You had a chipped tooth. I smiled back. A white boy. Never knew a white boy. At the Islamic school, boys were black. They prayed in front, never talked to girls unless they were their sisters, and became men we'd grow to marry. But not you, so MTV. I laid my weapons down. You walked behind me, kneeled and set your trap, pretended to tie your shoe, rose, then grabbed my shoulder. I was caught placed your other hand on my head, snatched my hijab and ran. I screamed as if someone had just cut me, placed my hands on my head to stop the bleeding, turned to find you standing stiff, your grin slowly leaving your face. My hair pulled into simple ponytail, bare to all black boys, white boys, they were pointing ooing at what you revealed. Me, naked, I couldn't breathe. I ran for the locker room ashamed, collapsed on the shower floor crying. How could I leave when everyone had just seen me? The Quran says believers should lower their gaze. They should turn from the desire to see that which shouldn't be seen. I had wanted to see myself that entire year, turned away imaginings of my hair in your hand, skin a shade lighter than my own. A white boy, never knew a white boy. I tried to keep it under wraps. You couldn't let me, could you? I wanted revenge like in the prophet's day. Chase you down, grab you from behind, tear out your tongue, cut off your hands and blind your eyes. But what would my father say? Away on pilgrimage, he was begging forgiveness for what he had seen. Pleading God forgive those men who months before in 93 tried to blow up a tower in Manhattan. How could I be a believer and wish to see that kind of rage? I had to forgive you. After class, I walked out of the locker room, arms over my head, a makeshift scarf. Coach Bell handed me my hijab and sent us both to the vice principal's office where you confessed and said you didn't know it was such a big deal. You were suspended, then paddled repeatedly. I didn't stay to watch, but heard you scream through the door, grasping hard your punishment. I wanted to turn and scream back, stop, stop. He didn't know what he was doing. But the door's hard lines reminded me, this was out of my control. I couldn't keep you from Justice. Wow. Thank you to every single one of our storytellers. You held vulnerability and strength, pain, fear, so many pieces of yourself tonight, and you did so with such grace. Thank you for looking at what it means to break bias for you and taking us on that journey. I also want to thank Amir and Stacy. You really dug deep with our storytellers and 
you held space in such a beautiful way. Thank you. Lots of gratitude to Halim Denedina, our event chair, our board of directors, our staff, and our volunteers. You make New Ground a really special place to be, an intentional community truly dedicated towards transforming community through the power of relationship. In a moment, we're about to invite you all into breakout rooms. These aren't just any old breakout rooms. But what we've learned at Newground is that it's not just about listening. Listening is an essential piece of what we do, and it is sacred. It's also about looking at your own authentic story and being able to articulate and share it with others. We have volunteers, people who have gone through our programs, who know why we do what we do, and they're gonna be waiting for you in those breakout rooms small breakout rooms with an intimate group of people who are willing to reflect on the prompt, what is alive for you? What story, after hearing all these stories about breaking bias, what story in your own personal experience is alive for you right now? Where you can share your response and listen to the responses of others in community. Because if we're really gonna break bias, we have to be willing to reflect, to listen, to hold, and to share openly, vulnerably, and authentically, learning from one another and with one another. Thank you for joining us. Please click Join Breakout Room now.